Hello and welcome to the second part of our 30th lecture for Math 353. So we're going to talk more about conservative vector fields and potential functions today. In particular, we're going to talk about how to find potential functions when you know your vector field is conservative. So we're going to begin doing this with an example. We're going to start with a vector field, which is given here, big F hat. And first we ask, is it conservative? So we have a relatively simple method to determine whether or not a vector field is conservative. <clears throat> I'm going to take the partial of the first component function, which I'll call little f, with respect to the second variable y, and I get this expression. There's a product rule involved in differentiating the cosine term. So this is the product, this is the partial of little f with respect to y, and then I'll take my second component function, little g, and take its partial with respect to x. So the partial of little g with respect to x looks like this. And in fact, those two terms are equal. So big F hat is a conservative vector field. Now that we know that it's conservative, we know that it is the gradient of something. That is the definition of a conservative vector field. So there is some scalar valued function that big F hat is the gradient of. Since we're already using little f and we're already losing, using little g here, I'm gonna call it little h. So I now know there is some little h, a real valued function of two real variables such that the gradient of little h gives me big F hat. That is to say, the two component functions of big F hat are the two first partials of little h. So dropping back here to have another look at big F hat, this is little h sub x, and this is little h sub y. I know that because this expression is the gradient of little h, that's what we've said. Little h is the potential function for big F, its gradient is big F, so this is its gradient, meaning this is its partial with respect to x, and this is its partial with respect to y. So I'm taking these two component functions here, and I'm labeling them as h sub x and h sub y. Now I want to find h. I have h is partial with respect to x, and it's partial with respect to y. The fundamental theorem of calculus, which I'll generally abbreviate as FTOC, that tells us that if you have a derivative and you integrate that derivative with respect to the same variable, you recover the original function. This is sort of the partial derivative version of the fundamental theorem of calculus that you would have studied in Calc 2, where you find, you take the integral of a derivative and that results in the original function. So integrals are antiderivatives, they undo derivatives, and this is one of the main ideas that knits differential and integral calculus together. Derivatives and integrals are inverse operations, just like exponentials and logarithms, just like addition and subtraction. If you do them in sequence, one will undo the other. So since we have little h and somebody took a derivative with respect to x, we're gonna integrate that with respect to x and recover little h in this way. So the partial of h with respect to x is that first component function of big F given here and I can certainly integrate that with respect to x, and I'm going to get an x squared y expression here. For the trig function, I have to use a little mini u substitution. You may not have to, but you could use a little mini u substitution to get to here. And then as we're taking an indefinite integral, we would also normally get a constant of integration, but our constant here is actually allowed to be a function of y. Some function of y is constant with respect to x, and so instead of having a constant, I just need an expression which is constant with respect to x, which means it's allowed to depend upon y, actually. So this is the expression that we're looking at at this point. And I'm gonna, I have several notes here and they basically re reiterate some of the things I've just said. So I did use a little mini u sub and going from here to here. It's also worth noting that whenever you have done an, a, an operation of this type, you've tried to take an antiderivative, you can always take a partial derivative and make sure that you recover your original integrand. So if I take this final line here and I take a partial with respect to x, I will get this integrand. This partial with respect to x give me two xy, the partial here with respect to x is gonna give me the y cosine of xy, and the partial of this with respect to x will be zero since it depends only on y. I don't know what it is yet, but I know it's a function just of y, so it's partial with respect to x is zero. And that's good, you should always do that. Math is full of one-way trap doors where technically you can go either way through the door, but one way is much easier than the other way. 
So generally differentiation is much easier for most folks than integration. If you think you have integrated properly, make sure to differentiate and, and check that you return to where you began as you should according to the fundamental theorem of calculus. And the third note is as we mentioned, our constant of integration is actually a function of y here. It's a constant with respect to x, but it is allowed to depend on y. So we now have an expression for little h, except that it involves this unknown constant, rather this unknown function of y. We need to find c of y. And once we have c of y backing up here, I can plug it into this position and I'll have a full expression for little h, which is what we want. So I need to find c of y. How am I gonna do this? I'm gonna do this by comparing two different versions of h sub y. So we're going to be able to write down expressions for h sub y in two different ways. And by comparing those two expressions, we should be able to determine what c of y is. The first expression for h sub y that I have is from my original representation of big F hat. So big F hat, it was the gradient of little h. So its first component function is the partial of little h with respect to x. More importantly, for our purposes now, its second component function is the partial of little h with respect to y. So the second component function of big F hat is a version of little h. I'm gonna scroll back through a couple of slides, and that's exactly what we've said right here. This is a version of little h that I've had since the beginning of the problem. I'm going to now have another version of little h which is gonna be the partial of the expression for, I'm sorry, I'm going to have another version of little h sub y, which is going to be the partial with respect to y of the expression for little h that I just found. So just here, scrolling back one slide, we have this expression for little h. I can take the partial of that with respect to y, and I'll be able to equate that to my other expression for little h, and this should allow me to solve for my function of y c. So from f hat, we know that h sub y looks like this. I also know from the expression for h that I just found that h sub y is going to be the partial with respect to y of this expression. This is the representation of h that I just found. I can take the partial of that with respect to y and I get this expression. Again, I don't know what c of y is, but I know if I take its derivative with respect to y, I'm just getting c prime of y because it's actually only a function of one variable. I don't have to talk about partials. I can just say it's the derivative with respect to that one variable here. And now I can compare these two. So these components line up, these components match up nicely, and it looks like c prime of y should be zero. If I want these two expressions for h sub y to be consistent, then I need c prime of y to be zero. So c prime of y should be zero, meaning that c of y was a constant function. It is the constant functions that have zero derivative. So I'm actually free to pick what constant value I would like c of y to be. I'm looking for a potential function, not the potential function. So there's not one answer. There's actually infinitely many potential functions, just like there's infinitely many antiderivatives for any given function. Assuming it has an antiderivative, then there's infinitely many. But this just means, just like you're often free to pick your constant of integration, here I am free to pick which constant value I want c of y to be, and I'm going to be a nice and virtuous lazy person and let c of y be zero, just because that will simplify my expression. So c of y gets to be any constant. If you wanted it to be two for some reason, you could make it two. It might annoy me slightly, but not enough that I would take away points. You would be technically correct. But c of y is actually just a constant. We can pick it to be zero, and that means h of x, y is gonna look like this. So we have at this point found a potential function for big F. And I'm gonna ask you to check that its gradient is big F, but let's, let's back up real quick before you start that and let's do some sort of big picture overview. We started with h sub x and h sub y. As soon as we knew that big F was conservative, we knew that its component functions were respective partials of some little h. So I went from this partial and I backed up from here to little h by integrating. I then differentiated with respect to the other variable and came down the other path so that I could match up this expression to another expression for h sub y. So this whole process has a bit of a flavor of going backwards first and then going down a different branch.
so that you can compare this version of h sub y with the version that I achieve by integrating this expression with respect to x and then differentiating the resulting expression with respect to y. So there's a little bit of backward and forward motion going on in this, but ultimately you are able to use this method to construct an expression for the potential function for a conservative vector field. Now do go ahead and check for me that the gradient of this little h is the big F hat that we began with. Go ahead and pause the video and give that a few minutes. All right, and we can see that it is. So here's my little h. The gradient's gonna be the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y. If you need a reminder on how gradients work, taking the partial of this with respect to x and we get this expression, taking the partial of little h with respect to y and we get this expression. And this is the f hat that we originally began with. So our procedure has been successful. Again, especially for this, finding a gradient is relatively straightforward. Finding a potential function is fairly elaborate. It follows multiple steps, taking integrals and then derivatives of those integrals and matching things up. And there's a fair amount involved in finding a potential function. So it's definitely an effective use of time to check your work after you think that you have found a potential function. Relatively little time commitment to actually check compared to the amount of work and the potential for mistakes that are involved in finding a potential function. So to summarize the procedure that we just developed via example, assuming you have already checked that your vector field is conservative, so you know that there is a potential function, to find it, you're gonna first note that your two component functions are the respective partials of little h, your potential function with respect to x and y. You are then gonna take the partial with respect to x, little f, and integrate it with respect to x. So it's a partial with respect to x, you're integrating it with respect to x to undo that partial and to re-arrive at h. Or equivalently, you could start over here and you could take little g here, which is the partial of h with respect to y, and integrate that with respect to y. So there's two possible ways to proceed here. We're gonna give the way that we just did in our example uh, in sort of the plain text, I suppose. And then in parentheses, we will mention, as we move through this set of steps, we'll mention what you would do at each step, where are you following this other path to the solution. So take either the partial, take little f and integrate it with respect to x, or take little g and integrate it with respect to y to undo the respective partial derivative that's been placed upon little h. So once you have found little h, you can then take its partial with respect to h and compare it to g in order to find your c prime of y expression. Equivalently, if you began by integrating the second component function, you'll now take its partial with respect to x. You would have been integrating it with respect to y. You'll now take its partial with respect to x. You'll compare that to f in order to find c prime of x. And we will have a problem, a sample problem, that I, my solution will be done down the other path here. Now that you've got the derivative of your function that depends only on one variable, you can solve for that function of one variable by taking a simple integral. And you can finally write down your expression for your potential function and check that its gradient is the vector field that you began with. All right, so let's do one more example before I hand you some sample problems. So here is a vector field. If it is conservative, find its potential function. It's worth noting that if it's not conservative, there's nothing to do. And you definitely wanna make sure that it is before you do any work because it's gonna be time consuming if you get embroiled in the process of attempting to find a potential function where one does not exist. Whereas checking whether or not a vector field is conservative is very straightforward and easy off the bat. So you can save lots of time, save yourself lots of time if you're able to just write it off and say, no, no potential function exists because f hat is not conservative. But what about here? For this, for this vector field, is f hat conservative? Yes, it turns out to be. So I take the first component function and take its partial with respect to y, get 2x. If I take the second component function and take its partial with respect to x, I also get 2x. Since those are equal, we are dealing with a conservative vector field. So there is gonna be some little h such that its partial with respect to x is the first component function of big F and such that it's partial with respect to y is the second component function of big F. That is to say the gradient of little h is big F.
And again, I'm just going to grab the first one here. I don't see, I don't really care which of these I integrate. Like I'm either going to integrate this with respect to X to recover little h, or I'm going to integrate this with respect to Y to recover little h. And neither looks particularly better than the other, so I'm just going to grab the one with respect to X, integrate it with respect to X. I will get X squared Y plus some function that depends only on Y, an expression that is constant with respect to X. And that is little h. So I started with its partial with respect to x right here, 2xy. I backed out to get h. Now I'm going to go down the other fork and take the partial of that with respect to y. So taking the partial of this expression with respect to y gives me x squared plus c prime of y. And based on my original vector field, big F, I also know that h sub y is equal to x squared plus 1. That's stated right here. Backing up one line, that is right there. So that has to be little h sub y, since this is little h's gradient. And so these are equal. And now, again, it's easy enough to compare them and see that c prime of y has to be 1. These terms already match up, so c prime of y must be 1 if these are to be equal. If c prime of y is 1, then c of y is going to just be y. I could write it as y plus 7, or y plus 2, or y minus pi if I wanted to. But I am not going to even bother with that actual constant here. We're always going to set it equal to zero. Technically, if you want it to be something else, you're welcome to make it. But it's only going to make things more complicated for no reason. So, as you will. But now I have c of y is 1, and I can revisit my original expression for h that involved c of y, and I can actually insert the value of c of y that I have found. So looking back here, we knew that h was x squared y plus c of y. Now I know that to be, sorry, now I know that to be x squared y plus y. And that's a potential function. And we can check it. We can take the gradient of h. The gradient of h is h sub x and h sub y. If I take the partial of this with respect to x, I get 2xy. The partial of this with respect to y, I get x squared plus 1. And that is the potential function that I began with. I'm sorry, that's not correct. I should say that is the vector field that I began with. And so I have successfully found a potential function for big F hat. So it's a fair amount of work Find a potential functions. A natural question you might ask is, why do we care about these? And that will become apparent in maybe two lectures from now or so. These potential functions are going to be important, and they're going to allow us to turn really difficult problems into relatively easy problems. The hardest part of those problems will be finding the potential function. So this step that we're practicing right now, it's going to be the key in solving some problems that will otherwise likely be impossible. So it is going to matter, but you're going to have to let me develop a bit more machinery. We're going to have to talk about integrals, line integrals, before we're able to see why we care about these potential functions. So for now, trust me that conservative vector fields are important, and the ability to find a potential function for a conservative vector field is going to make your life much, much easier when we start to consider certain line integrals. All right, so let's have you folks do one of these. Here is a vector field. If it is a conservative vector field, find its potential function. So go ahead and pause the video. I definitely encourage you to look back at the list of steps that we have outlined and also look at the examples. It is not unlikely that, there, that you might have some difficulty with the sample problem. Please give it some thought. We'll have some homework problems on this to give some more practice, but do look at the examples and, and look at the list of steps that we have outlined to try to help you get through this. All right, give it a go. All right, so let's discuss this. If you have had time to pause the video, let's take a look at the solution. Let me also say that it is entirely possible, especially for certain vector fields and for some people to just write down the potential function for a vector field. So if you're able to eyeball it, if you're really good at taking antiderivatives in your head and you can sort of intuit what is the function whose partial with respect to x gives me the first component function and whose partial with respect to y gives me the second component function, you're welcome to do that. I would definitely encourage you to check. In fact, well, okay, I say you're welcome to do that. I shouldn't say that. You're not welcome to do that anymore in this class. It's a great way to do it. It's a good thing to be able to do. 
but because we're not having proctored exams, I actually have to require you to show me work at this point. So I'm generally pretty lenient about and understanding that some folks are able to just write down the answer and then check that it's right. And I support that fully. It's a great way to do math. If you can write down the correct answer and then check that it's the correct answer, that's excellent. But since I do actually need you to show me your work for the remainder of the course, you can disregard what I was beginning to say there. So, sorry about that. So we want to first know, is big F hat conservative? And if it is, then we want to find its potential function. So we're gonna check if it's conservative. I'm gonna take the first component function and I'm gonna take its partial with respect to Y. So doing that, I'm gonna have to, this is gonna be zero when I take its partial with respect to Y. I get a chain rule here and an X e to the X Y pops out. For this expression, there's gonna be a product rule and one of the derivatives involved in the product rule is gonna also involve the chain rule. And ultimately I get this expression. And then I'm gonna gather these two like terms together and end up with two x e to the x y plus x squared y e to the x y. I can also take the partial of the second component function of big F with respect to the first variable x, and that gives me two x e to the x y and x squared y e to the x y as well. Again, there's a product rule. One of the product rules involves a chain rule, and the partial of the constant is zero. And so they're equal because the partial of the first component function with respect to the second variable equals the partial of the second component function with respect to the first variable, I know that my vector field is conservative. Therefore, there does exist some potential function so that its partial with respect to x is the first component function of big F, and its partial with respect to y is the second component function of big F. Now I have to pick one of these to integrate. I'm either gonna integrate the top line here with respect to x, or the bottom line with respect to y, and I would actually rather integrate this bottom line with respect to y. That looks like that's gonna be a little bit easier. There's at least one fewer sum end. So I'm gonna take the second component function of big F, which is the partial of h with respect to y. I'm gonna integrate that with respect to y to undo that derivative, and that should get me back to little h. So taking a partial with respect to y, we get this expression. The partial of this term with respect to y is just gonna be x e to the x y. There's sort of a mini little u sub in here if you like. It's a, it's a partial with, or I mean it's an integral with respect to y, so remember that x is constant. And you can double check me by taking the partial of this with respect to y, and you'll see that you get this expression back. Simpler is that the antiderivative of one with respect to y is just y, and we do pick up a constant but it's not exactly a constant, it's only a constant with respect to y, meaning it's allowed to depend on x. So this is that integral, and again, I do encourage you to take the partial of this whole, res this whole expression with respect to y and make sure that you recover the antiderivative, I mean, recover the integrand from the original expression. So this is a expression for h, there's just this bit of obscurity in here, right? We need to know what c of x is. Once we have that worked out, we'll have a full expression for h. So we're gonna solve for c of x at this point. And again, I do that by following, moving down the other branch in terms of partial derivatives. So we started with h sub y. We backed out by taking an integral to get to h. Now I'm gonna go down the other path and find h sub x from this. So h sub x, looking at the second line, taking this expression here, I say from above, and I mean from right here, taking this expression for h and taking its partial with respect to x is gonna yield me this expression here. So this x e to the x y, when I take its partial with respect to x, I pick up these two terms via the product rule, and one of them involves the chain rule. The derivative of y with respect to x is just zero, it's gone and the derivative of c of x with respect to x is just c prime of x. So that's what I get when I take the partial of this line with respect to x. That is h sub x, since that was h. I have another expression for h sub x, which was my first component function from big F hat. So big F hat was, its first component function was 2x plus e to the xy plus xy e to the xy, and now I can compare these two different expressions for h sub x. So this term matches that term. These line up nicely. This term matches that term. These line up nicely. The leftovers here are my c prime of x on the bottom, 
and my 2x expression in the first line, in line bullet point one here. So those must be equal for these two expressions to be equal. And that means c prime of x must be 2x, which indicates that c of x is gonna be x squared for me here. And again, I could add a plus one or a minus three or something if I wanted to, but that's silly. So x squared suffices. Now we have our expression for little h. We already had these two components. What was missing was we didn't know what the c of x was, and we've just solved for c of x to be equal to x squared. So this gives me an expression for little h, and you should check that the gradient of that little h is f hat. Big f hat is the gradient of little h. It does work, and we have successfully found the potential function. All right, one more sample problem. I recognize that these are involved, so one more sample problem here today. Here's another big F, big F hat. If it is conservative, find its potential function. So pause the video and let's give this another go here. All right, so hopefully you realize that this is a bit of a trick question. It's really not a trick question, but it's just much easier than you may have feared because it's not a conservative vector field. There, it's not a conservative vector field, so there's nothing further to do. There is no potential function to find. This vector field is not the gradient of anything. It's a different kind of vector field. It's not a conservative vector field. And definitely check that again. You don't want to get yourself tangled up in trying to find a potential function that doesn't exist. Things won't work and you'll wonder what you're doing wrong when in fact you're just barking up a non-existent tree, I suppose. So don't do that. That's a silly thing to do. <clears throat> That'll wrap it for today's lecture. This has been our, our intro to vector fields. Next time we're gonna talk about line integrals and we'll spend a couple of lectures talking about line integrals before we can move into our last major topics, which are gonna be three very important theorems. The fundamental theorem of line integrals, Green's theorem divergence form, and Green's theorem curl form. So thank you folks, have a good night.